by the time Mendel did his F2 crosses, he did what he set out to do. He explained how inheritance happens. He explained heredity through a, through a science that would later on be called genetics after the genes that he discovered, but he called them factors. He did a lot, though. He discovered that sometimes there's two different kinds of genes, and that genes sometimes are overpower other genes, and they're called dominant genes. And that when you combine a dominant gene with a recessive gene, the dominant is always the one that shows up. And the recessive only shows if it's by itself. He also figures out that these genes never blend, but that instead, mom's genes and dad's genes talk to each other in a dominant relationship, and that they never truly blend, but they always remain separate. And that that's true because when you want to have a kid, your genes separate to different gametes, and then these gametes will combine with your wife's or husband's uh, uh, genes to form a new entity that still is not bland. How does he know that? Because the recessive comes back in the F2 generation when you do the F1 cross. So he's discovering all these things. He discovers this, therefore, the only thing that makes sense is that there must be two ways to look dominant. That you can look dominant by being homozygous dominant, in other words, having two copies of the dominant gene, or by having a copy of the dominant gene and a copy of the recessive gene. He also discovered something that we're still going to be talking about, which is the idea of independent assortment, which is one, one trait does not affect the way the other trait is passed on, even though he was not completely right about that. But either way, Mendel set out to do that, and he did a lot. After seven years of meticulously collecting data, and then he did a test process where he didn't, he did a prediction of what was going to happen based on his knowledge of what he understood about genetics after discovering how it worked. And the test crosses came out exactly the way he expected them to come out. So his F2 cross proved to him that he knew what he was doing. But what inspired Mendel in the first place to do all of this research, especially with flowers, was this particular mystery. And he collected with a yellow flower. So he did this first and, and he got this. All the flowers that came out of that cross, no matter how many times he tried that cross, were green. And so he said, fine, there is no blending, see? If it was a blending, you would get something in between, but there is no blending, you just get green. Green dominates over yellow, dominates. There you go. There is no blending. So what is it? It's particle, it's particle thing. How does he figure that out? Well, uh, when, when he gets a green flower... Whenever he got a green flower and he combines with another green flower, he expects to get green flowers, right? But what happens? He actually gets all green flowers. Every time he gets green flowers, no matter how many times he tries. So it's fine. Green flowers can only make green flowers. But then he wants to be a good scientist and he tries this again just to be sure. And then he gets two different green flowers and crosses them together or crosses them with each other, with themselves, right? But this time... To his surprise, what actually ends up happening is that he, he makes three green flowers and one yellow flower. And now he starts to think about something. How does this make any sense? There must be two different kinds of green because this doesn't make any sense. This is a look that was usually overpowered that all of a sudden is showing up out of nowhere. What is happening? How can two green flowers make a yellow flower? That makes no sense. Then he decides, I need to make, redo the other one too, because this one, when I did it again, I got a different result. So let me do the other one. Uh, well, by the way, first of all, he's going to do two yellows and try to see if that same thing happens to yellow. But no matter how many tries he tries, he always gets yellow. So that tells him something about that the color green on the, on the seeds is, is acting different from the way the color yellow is acting. And so he's trying to figure this all out. And then he does... The same thing he did here again to be a good scientist and do, and do this many, many times. And he gets a yellow flower and a green flower, connects them with each other, and then what do you get? He expects to get the same result, but he doesn't. Instead, this time, half the time he gets the green flower, half the time he gets the yellow flower. And now he's really lost. There seems to be no freaking pattern to the way this is working. I am completely lost. And that's why he spent seven years trying to figure this out. And eventually he does, once he realizes the things I talked about in the beginning of the lecture by doing the crosses that we talked about in the previous videos. Now that he's done all these crosses, he goes back to this problem and he knows the solution. What is happening here is that even though it looks like he's doing 
uh, the same crosses is actually doing different crosses. Even though it looks like these two crosses here are the same, they are two different crosses. Even though it looks like these two different crosses are the same, they're two different crosses. And the reason why this cross is always the same way is because there's no other way to make two red flowers. Let's talk about that. Start with this one, which is easy. Yellow is recessive. So the only way, according to what he finds out, to be like that is if you have two paired recessive genes, which means what you're doing here is a true breeding cross between a homo homozygous recessives. And in a true breeding cross, you always make a copy of the parents. And so that's what's happening here. We know this is a true breeding cross. Now, he also knows that this is probably what's also happening on this one because I get two things that look the same and I always make them look the same. And so I self-cross this with itself and I always get that. That is because these two, these two things are pure true breeder flowers as well. And so all of these will also be true breeder flowers the same way these were always true breeder flowers. So that's a true breeding cross. But now he knows that this is not a true breeding cross because you're getting a different look here. So he knows that there's now have to be two different kinds of green. So what he's actually doing here is doing big G, little g versus big G, little g. So what he's actually doing is connecting two flowers that seem to look the same because this flowers will still look green because since they have a, a, a dominant gene, they look green. And so they get flowers that seem to look the same and they put that out like this. And then what you get, if you do the Punnett square like we did in previous videos, you get one out of four that looks like this. You're going to get two out of four that have this gene, big G, little g, and you're going to have one out of four that's big G, big G. But these three will be green because all of them have a big G. But this one will be yellow because it has a little g. So whenever this flower donates that and, and that, you're going to get that yellow. But whenever any other combination is going to be green. And so he figures out that the reason why this cross is different from that cross is because that cross was a true breeding cross, but this cross is actually an F1 cross or a cross between hybrids. And so he now he starts to see and explain this problem with flowers. Now let's look at this one. He crosses these two and he always, always, always gets the same. So he, what, he realized that what's happening here is that he's actually breathing, uh, doing a, what crosses should this be? You should recognize what cross do you get two things that look different and make something that all look the same. That is a P cross. So what you're actually doing there is crossing a big G, big G with a little G, little G. So a pure green and a pure yellow. What do you get? All of these children are going to be hybrids. And so what you're doing is a P1 cross, and that's why you get those results. And hybrids look dominant, so they always look like that, no matter how many times you try that cross. But on this time, what is he doing here? This time, he's doing something different. This time, he's doing big G, uh, little g. Ver so it's not doing the same thing he thought he was doing before. It's a different kind of green versus little g, little g. Now you should realize that this is what is an F2 cross where the children are going to have the same ratio as the parents. One to one, one to run. So these two will be big G, little g, and these two will be little g, little g. And now you understand why are you getting these two crosses. By the way, there is another way to get that this same result here. You can also get that same result by doing another type of cross as well. So... Later on, he figures that out, when he, and he figures out the need for a test cross to tell the difference between these, these uh, uh, dominant phenotypes, because the dominant phenotype could also be something like this. You could have big G versus little g connected with big G versus big G. This is also an F2 cross, but in this F2 cross, you're going to have half the people who have big G, little g, and half the people big G, big G, but all of these people will look green. So you, you can't even tell the difference between these two crosses when you do them, which is why you have to do a test cross to find out if something that looks green is actually green or not. So how could you do that? You can cross it with itself, and if you cross it with itself, and you get, so if you cross this with, your, with itself, and you, all, and you get something that looks th three to one ratio, is because you were doing something like this, right? 
So it was really a hybrid. But if you cross it with itself, and it's, and it's always making that, you were making this cross, so it was not a hybrid, it was a homozygous dominant. That is self-pollination method. But you can also do a test cross method. If you cross it with something you know to be recessive, because it looks recessive, and that's what he did, uh, and you get something that always looks green, always have one look, what you actually did is this cross up here, that cross up there, so you did this cross, and therefore, you know you had a homozygous dominant green. But if you do the same cross, and you get half green, half yellow, you know that what you had was this thing, a homozygous green. So that is what the test cross is for. But see how he figured this out? He figured it out that the reason why he was getting different results on these mysterious crosses is because there was two ways of looking green. And that explained particle genetics for him and it opened the doors to, to the solution for the problem with flowers. All right? Now in the next, next vi two videos, we're going to be talking about dihybrid crosses and independent assortment, which is the last discovery that Mandel made.